Thornberry Township is located in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, about 20 miles west of Philadelphia. The township's 5,900 acres include a western plateau and eastern hills and valleys. Woods, streams, and beautiful views are common throughout the area. Both the eastern branch of the Chester Creek and the western branch flow through the township on their way to the Delaware River. Before European settlement, Thornberry was part of the summer hunting grounds of the Lenape Indians. Lenape is an Indian word that means real people. Early white settlers referred to the Lenape as the Delaware River Indians, and as a result, they have since often been called the Delawares. The Lenape were a hunting and foraging people who lived in small, independent bands. In the winter months, they moved westward to hunt deer, but from early spring to late fall, they lived in Delaware County and other areas along the tributary river valleys on the western side of the Delaware River. Their warm weather food supply was made up of fish that came up river to spawn, woodlands game, a few crops, mostly maize, and whatever they could gather from the forest. The Lenape people were one of the more peaceful Indian groups along the eastern seaboard. They were also known for their generosity. William Penn wrote of them, nothing is too good for their friend. Give them a fine gun, coat, or other thing, and it may pass 20 hands before it sticks. Light of heart, they never have much nor want much. The pay or presents I made them were not hoarded by their owners. As white settlements grew in size, the Lenape bands were crowded out. By 1740, almost all of the Indians had moved out of the area. Possibly the first white explorer to visit the Delaware River region was the Englishman Henry Hudson, who came here in 1609. The Dutch, Swedes, and English were the first European settlers. In 1681, the King of England, Charles II, gave the land area that includes present-day Thornberry Township to William Penn. Penn's territory was called Penn's Woods or Pennsylvania. Among those who secured land from Penn in the Thornberry area was George Pierce. This 1703 map shows Pierce's land holdings and it is said that the township derives its name from the birthplace of Pierce's wife in Thornberry, England. Thornberry was first recognized as a township in 1687 with the appointment of Hugh Duborow as constable. One of the things that drew early settlers to the area was water. Rushing creeks that provided water power for mills of all kinds. On the west branch of the Chester Creek were the Brinton Mills, just upstream from the Concord Township line. In 1788, the Brinton family ran a sawmill, malt house, and brewery there. In 1802, there was a grist mill on the site. The grist mill became a woolen mill, which was destroyed by fire in 1835. Caleb Brinton then built a stone grist mill, which is still standing today. Over the years, the building has been used as a restaurant, a speakeasy, and a nightclub that helped launch the careers of the four aces. In the 1920s, it was used as a clubhouse for a summer resort colony. In the 1930s, boxing matches were held in front of the building. Today, the former grist mill is the Old Mill Inn. Part of the restaurant's charm is a working water wheel inside the building. The waters of the east branch of the Chester Creek also powered early industry in Thornberry. By 1750, one of the country's first ironworks was built here by John Taylor. Known as Sarum Forge, it was located between Chester Creek and what is today Stony Bank Road, just south of Forge Road. 
Taylor's Forge was a rolling and slitting mill. Iron bars were brought there to be rolled flat. This flattened iron could then be slit into strips, which might be used to reinforce wagon wheels or to make nails or barrel hoops. One visitor to the forge in 1756 described Sarum as having three stacks and in full blast. The success of Taylor's Ironworks and others like it proved so much competition for British industry that in 1750 the English Parliament passed a law forbidding further construction of ironworks in the American colonies. Over the years, other mills were built along the waters of the Chester Creek. Grist mills, sawmills, paper mills. Most have long since deteriorated or been washed away. One that has survived is the old James Mill on Creek Road. Now restored as a residence, it's a reminder of a time when Thornberry was known for its industry, not the quiet country living that characterizes the township today. It's hard to go very far in the township without running into the Cheney name. The Cheneys were among the early settlers in Thornberry, and a section of the township still bears their name. The most famous Cheney of them all, Squire Thomas Cheney, is buried in the Cheney Family Cemetery opposite Cheney University. As a fighting Quaker, he couldn't be buried in a cemetery of that pacifist group, and so had to be buried in a family burial ground. Squire Cheney did his fighting in the Revolutionary War. His biggest contribution to the American cause came at the Battle of the Brandywine River, which was fought within earshot of the western end of the township. General Washington had brought his troops to the Brandywine River to try to stop the British under General Howe. Howe was marching north towards Philadelphia, the colonial capital. Washington deployed his troops along the fords of the Brandywine. He hoped to engage General Howe at Chad's Ford, which was on the road to Philadelphia. On the morning of September 11, 1777, Howe sent a part of his army to Chad's Ford to preoccupy General Washington. Meanwhile, hidden by the woods, rolling hills, and morning fog, Howe led a large force around Washington's right, hoping to surprise Washington from behind. During the day at his headquarters in Chad's Ford, Washington received conflicting reports about British troop activity. Some reports said the British were trying to come around behind him. Another report said this wasn't the case. Washington stayed where he was, not wanting to move his men until he had more reliable information. That afternoon, Squire Thomas Cheney came riding towards Washington's camp. He came to report that he had seen British troops coming around behind Washington. General Washington, General Washington, there's a rider coming. Washington. At first, Washington didn't believe Cheney, and Cheney is reported to have asked that his trustworthiness be checked with other area patriots, telling Washington, if you doubt my word, put me under guard until you can ask Anthony Wayne or Persifer Fraser if I am a man to be believed. I would have you know that I have this day's work at much at heart as heir of blood of you. Convinced by the reports of Cheney and others, Washington moved his troops to respond to House flanking maneuver. The Americans met and fought the British near the Birmingham Quaker Meeting House. The battle was a fierce one. The sound of the fighting could be heard in Philadelphia some 25 miles away. When it was all over, the British had triumphed, forcing an American retreat. The Colonials lost the Battle of Brandywine, but thanks to information supplied by Squire Cheney and others, they were able to avoid a devastating surprise attack that could have destroyed the American army and seriously threatened the American cause. As Washington and his men retreated from their defeat at Brandywine, they passed through Thornberry near the Yellow House. This is the Yellow House as it appeared in a 1905 postcard. Over the years, the building has been a post office, a store, and a cloth factory. 
Today, it's a post office and store, the hub of beautiful downtown Thornton. At the time of the Battle of Brandywine, it was the summer home of George Gray, a ferry boat operator in Philadelphia. The Gray's Ferry section of Philadelphia bears his name. Fearing a British attack on Philadelphia, Gray moved his family out to Yellow House. Little did he realize he was moving them right next to a major battle at the Brandywine River. Gray's daughter, 11 years old at the time, used to tell of seeing defeated American troops retreating from the Brandywine battlefields and fleeing through Thornberry. It's been said that the reason Thornton was known for a while as Shintown was due to this hasty retreat by Washington's men, perhaps banging their shins on fences, rocks, and stumps as they fled through Thornton. On September 12, 1777, the day after the Battle of Brandywine, British troops advancing through Thornberry stopped at the home of Joseph and Anne Hemphill. The Hemphills lived in the original section of present-day Sweetwater Farm. Joseph was away serving in Washington's army when the British arrived. The troops spent the night in the Hemphill barn and stables, but forced Anne to stay up all night in the house, cooking and baking for them. The next day, as the soldiers were leaving, Anne and her children climbed aboard the wagon on which the British were hauling away her food supplies. When they asked her what she was doing, she replied that if they were taking her food, they would have to take her too. The British bowed to her protest and left the food behind. The British also stopped at the Thornberry home of the Frasers, Persifer and Mary, or Polly as she was also known. The ruins of their house still stand off Loxley Road in the township. Persifer was an officer in Washington's army. Mary, seen in this silhouette portrait from about 1820, was the granddaughter of John Taylor who had built Sarum Forge. While her husband fought nearby in the Battle of Brandywine, Mary, an accomplished horsewoman, rode about the edge of the battle checking on the progress of the fighting. After the battle was over, Persifer Fraser was captured by the British. Meanwhile, at the Fraser home, on the same day her husband was captured, Mary Fraser had her own encounter with the British. The Fraser home had been used by the Americans as a storage place for ammunition and officers' baggage. Not knowing it had been removed, the British sent a body of troops to the Fraser home looking for the American ammunition. Others in the Fraser household fled at the approach of the British, but Mary stayed behind and carted wool as the troops marched up to her house. The first soldier who burst into the house was a Scotsman. Where are the damned rebels? Recalling that the Scots themselves had staged a rebellion against England in 1745, Mary replied, I know of no rebels. There is not, I believe, a Scotsman about the place. How dare you speak to me like that? Who do you think you are? How dare you put the Scots into the same camp as you traitors? Other soldiers came into the Fraser house, and a search for arms and ammunition was begun. Among other things, they found liquor and began to get drunk. A Captain de West came in just as one of the men was about to strike Mary Fraser. You there! Stop that! Are you Mrs. Fraser, wife of Colonel Fraser? I am she. Mrs. Fraser, I understand that this house is full of arms and ammunition from the rebel forces. I know of no ammunition in this house. Maybe the arms and ammunition are upstairs. You open the door, Mrs. Fraser. You open the door to the upstairs just in case there's a rebel behind it with a gun waiting to shoot me. I have told you there is no ammunition in this house. And if you want that door open, you will have to open it yourself. No rifleman was found behind the door. And as his men continued to search the house, the captain made Mary an offer. I'd like to inform you that there are persons employed by my government who can offer very high terms to some of the American officers to induce them to join the British Army. Were they to join, they would receive a commission, their past rebellion would be overlooked, and they would be given a reward besides. Your husband, Mrs. Fraser, is one of the persons designated for this offer. If you could use your great influence with him, he would probably accept the offer. I can't stress too strongly how much happier and better off you would be if you were to join our cause. Sir. You do not know Colonel Fraser, or you would not undertake such a thing. Nor would he listen to me, should I propose it. But if it were possible to persuade him, and he should consent to become a traitor to his country, I should consent never to have anything to do with him again. 
As you wish. The choice is your own, Mrs. Fraser. Captain DeWest, look, ammunition boxes and chests. What have we here? Chests and ammunition boxes? Sorry, sir. Nothing but uniforms in these chests, sir. No ammunition in here after all. I'm leaving, ma'am. I had orders to burn the house and barn to the ground, but these I give to you. I can't thank you enough, sir, for what is my own. And if such were your orders, you would dare not to disobey them. Good day to you, ma'am. Good day to you, sir. There were to be other encounters with the British for Mary Fraser. Within a month, she traveled to Philadelphia, which was then under British control. She went there to visit her husband, Persifer, who was being held prisoner by the British. He was confined in the Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall. With a pass from General Washington, she crossed American and British lines and was permitted to see her husband. Not only did she get in to see him, she also was able to smuggle out a letter from he and the other prisoners to General Washington. The letter described their suffering and their poor conditions. She also smuggled out proof of their situation, a piece of the worm-eaten bread that was being fed to the prisoners. She brought the bread and the letter to General Washington, and in her account of the events, she wrote, I saw General Washington next morning at headquarters. When I was introduced, I gave him the papers and the bread. The statement of the suffering conditions of the prisoners moved him very much. General Washington immediately communicated with the British General Howe regarding the treatment of the American prisoners in Philadelphia, and their situation was then somewhat improved, though they were never treated as they should have been. Washington and his men spent the cold, hard winter that followed the Battle of Brandywine camped outside Philadelphia at Valley Forge. They had little in the way of proper food and clothing. Mary Fraser continued to serve the American cause, making repeated trips to Valley Forge, bringing warm stockings she had knitted and food and clothing she had collected from her friends and neighbors in Thornberry. It is said that one of those neighbors, Squire Thomas Cheney, was so convinced that the Americans would triumph despite the desperate condition of their army at Valley Forge that he wrote of the situation in a poem. Cheerful spirits here will stay and guard against despotic sway, though Britain's numerous frightful fleet makes oceans groan beneath its weight and guns and drums cry out so loud to appease the vengeance of their Lord. Yet America will be free. Yet America will be free. Not long after the Revolutionary War, in 1785, there were 16 counties in Pennsylvania. One of those counties was Chester County. In 1789, Chester County split in two, with the western end retaining the Chester County name, and the eastern end becoming Delaware County. As Thornberry Township was right on the dividing line between the two counties, township landowners on the borderline were given a choice as to which county they wanted to be a part of. This explains the rather jagged northern border of the township, as one landowner might choose to be a part of Chester County, while his neighbor might choose Delaware County. In 1842, the present-day boundaries of the township were achieved when the Pennsylvania legislature added to Thornberry the northern end of Aston Township. In the early 1800s, stirrings of a religious revival began in America. The revival became known as the Second Great Awakening and featured outdoor camp meetings, traveling preachers, and much religious enthusiasm. One of the converts at a Methodist camp meeting in the Thornberry area was a teenager named Israel Pyle. It is said his mother locked him in his room and hid his Sunday clothes to keep him from going to the meetings, but Israel snuck out his bedroom window to attend. Once converted, Israel took an active role in the Methodist church till his death in 1860. It is said he did more than any other man to establish the Methodist Church in Delaware County. In the Thornberry area, one of Israel's most notable contributions to the Methodist cause was the establishment of a church on Stony Bank Road in the present-day Glen Mills section of the community. It was organized as the Stony Bank Methodist Episcopal Church in 1810. Meetings were held in a schoolhouse till a stone church was built in 1812. The current structure replaced that stone building in 1870. An addition was added in 1970. 
The church's sanctuary still retains its 19th century charm. In 1842, Israel's brother-in-law, Alban Pyle, tired of traveling to church at Stony Bank from his home in the Thornton section of the township, organized services closer to home. These meetings were held in the loft of this building opposite the Yellow House in Thornton. At the time, it was a wheelwright's shop. Several years later, the church meetings were moved here to Alban Pyle's house on the present-day West Town Road. The meetings in Alban's parlor were well attended and religious fervor was described as being at a flood tide. In 1846, the Thornton Methodists built their own building on a three-quarter acre lot that they purchased from Alban for $30. The church was given the name Bethlehem Methodist by Alban's daughter, Alice. In 1891, for the cost of $7,000, the present building was built on approximately the same location as the original building. Several additions have since been made. The interior features beautiful stained glass windows and a natural wood ceiling. It was also in the early 1800s that the township's third currently active church got its start. The Thornberry African Methodist Episcopal Church was organized sometime prior to 1834. In 1840, the congregation bought an old frame schoolhouse and moved it to a spot in front of an already existing African-American cemetery. The cemetery is still in use today. Its tombstones date back to Revolutionary War times and include those who fought in the Civil War as well as both World Wars. In 1958, the church building was almost totally destroyed by a heavy snowfall. The blizzard of 58 was a heavy, wet snow with drifts as high as 14 feet. The township was snowbound for almost three days. The snow collapsed the roof of the church, crushing pulpit and pews, but not the congregation's spirit. A new building was soon built and furnished with the generous help of the surrounding community. Today, the congregation looks back on 150 years of service to the Thornberry area. They look forward to continued growth and usefulness. On the south side of the eastern branch of Chester Creek, along Stony Bank Road, are ruins of the paper mills after which the Glen Mills section of the township is named. These mills were built by the Wilcox family, who had been making paper in America since colonial times. The Wilcoxes had two mills at Glen Mills, a lower mill built in 1837, and an upper mill that was built almost 10 years later. It was located about a quarter of a mile away. The mills made a variety of products, including book paper, collar paper, music paper, and food packaging papers. Their most famous product, however, was a high quality paper on which the US government printed currency and revenue stamps. During the Civil War, almost all the paper money used by the Union was printed on paper made at the Glen Mills. This currency manufacturer earned for Glen Mills the name the Million Dollar Village. The Glen Mills made currency paper using a Wilcox originated process that mixed tiny blue and red threads in with the paper. This was done with a Wilcox invention, the Ford Rainier machine. After 1878, the Wilcox family lost the government currency contract. Other kinds of papers were manufactured at Glen Mills till 1926 when the mills fell into disuse. On August 5th, 1843, not many years after Wilcox's first mill was built, it and every other mill in Thornberry were battered by a great storm. The storm resulted in one of the most rapid rises of water ever recorded in a temperate climate. After a steady all-day rain, a cloudburst hit about 2 p.m. Low black clouds came in from different directions and collided over the area. Lightning and thunder were almost continuous. 
The rain came down in torrents. A report from nearby Concord said there were 16 inches of rain in three hours. Creeks surged over their banks. Streams flooded as the rains poured down. Homes, bridges, dams, livestock and possessions were swept away. Waves of water came down the Chester Creek. At one point, the water rose almost instantaneously, about five to 10 feet. Intermittent destructive winds blew from different directions. A tornado was reported in Concord. In Thornberry, Thatcher's mill was wholly carried away, and the Wilcox, Brenton, and Edwards mills were damaged. The rain continued to pour down. One man said that the rain fell in such sheets that instead of obscuring his vision, it was like looking through a sheet of glass. Though no lives were lost in Thornberry, 19 died in surrounding areas. As quickly as the storm struck, it left. By about 6 p.m., the rain had ceased, and by the next morning, creeks were back to their normal levels. The Great Flood was only a temporary setback to Thornberry Township's growth and development. This progress was spurred onward in 1858 by the completion of the Westchester and Philadelphia Railroad through the township. This is a picture of the line's first train into Westchester. The line was 27 miles long with strategic passing sidings and multiple stations between Philadelphia and Westchester. It transported passengers, mail, and freight. The first stations in Thornberry were in Cheney and in Glen Mills. The original Cheney station was a three-story brick building built around 1867. It was replaced by this current station in 1909. The Glen Mills station also dates from the early days of the line. It's a beautiful example of late Gothic revival architecture featuring high arched windows, ornamental brickwork, and heavy wood framings. The building is being restored both inside and out by the Township Historical Society. Over the years of the railroad's operation, the second floor of the Glen Mills station has often been the home of the station ticket agent. Dick Luckenbach, former president of the Thornberry Historical Society, described some of the unique experiences that were part of living in a working train station. When there were uh, express trains run to Westchester, uh, there was a passing siding uh, near here, and uh, the local trains or the freight trains would pull off into the passing siding and wait for the express to pass, and frequently uh, they might be even a half hour difference, but uh, it was cheaper to spend that time than have an accident. And so the train crew uh, cultivated gardens in back of the Glen Mills train station and would tend their garden waiting for the uh, train to pass and uh, they became very friendly with the ticket agent and uh, uh, they would also uh, be very considerate at nap time uh, when they knew the kids were uh, sleeping in the afternoon during the day and they would subdue their whistling so they wouldn't disturb the kids too much. There have been uh, uh, many uh, important incidents. Uh, in one case, a station agent some years ago uh, uh, made off in the wrong direction with some of the money, so he hung himself uh, in the station. And at another time, a woman uh, uh, was having a baby, uh, get, trying to get to the hospital, but uh, uh, time ran out, so she had her baby in the waiting room. The township's third railroad station is the Loxley Flag Station. It was built in 1891. The station received its name from a railroad official who, while searching for a name for the station, happened to be reading the English poet Tennyson's poem, Loxley Hall. In 1861, three years after the railroad came to the township, shots were fired on Fort Sumter, and the nation was plunged into civil war. Men from the Thornberry area fought in a variety of units, including the 97th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment, which saw action at Petersburg, Fort Wagner, and in this battle at Cold Harbor, Virginia. In another Virginia battle during the Bermuda 100 campaign, the regiment flag was shredded by over 100 bullets, and seven color bearers were shot down. 
The unit's replacement flag was likewise ripped by gunfire. In 1862 and again in 1863, when Confederate forces crossed the Potomac and headed north, Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania called for the mobilization of home defense units. One of these units was formed by men in Thornberry and Edgemont townships. It was led by Captain Joseph Wilcox. The unit was sent to Harrisburg, site of a federal rail depot and a likely rebel target. During the 1863 mobilization, Lieutenant Miller of the Thornberry Edgemont unit wrote home to complain that in the Harrisburg stores that had remained open in the face of the rebel threat, some shopkeepers raised their prices, seeking to make a fortune off the soldiers who had come to defend Harrisburg. The Confederates never got to Harrisburg and the home guard units were soon sent back to their own homes. An area on Thornton Road near Cheney Road used to be known as Hazard's Hollow. It was so named after Squire Thomas Hazard, who moved to Thornberry in 1861, the year the Civil War began. The son of escaped slaves, Hazard went on to become owner of over 30 pieces of property in Thornberry's elected Justice of the Peace for nearly 20 years. Squire Hazard is just one part of the long tradition of Thornberry's African-American community. This tradition has included a free black population from very early on in the township's history. In 1780, there were only three slaves listed as living in all of Thornberry. The long-term presence of a free black population has contributed to the history of racial harmony in the township. Greg Hammond, whose family has lived in the area since 1790, describes part of that history. This community was you know, primarily a farm community, and so as farmers in this community, they depended on one another. You know, blacks depended on whites, and whites depended on the blacks. Uh, when you were going to build a new barn, it didn't matter whether you were black or white, they would come and help you build your new barn. If you were going to harvest your crop, it didn't matter whether you were black or white, you know, they came and helped you harvest your crop. Um, my aunt uh, told me that uh, she didn't experience segregation until she uh, went into Philadelphia and there you had to sit in the back of the bus and things of that matter. The generations of African Americans that have lived in Thornberry have produced lawyers, professors and businessmen, proud additions to the record of free black achievement. The township's largest landowner is the Glen Mill Schools, a reform school for court sentenced young men. The schools own some 800 acres, most of which is kept as open land. Founded in 1826 as the House of Refuge, the schools were at several locations in Philadelphia before coming to Glen Mills. This is the first Philadelphia location on Ridge Avenue. The schools came here to the township in 1892. Today, it is the oldest school for juvenile offenders in the country. The Glen Mills schools are unique not only in their longevity, but also in their approach. As you can see from these pictures of the campus, this isn't the normal reform school. There are no locks or bars or cramped cells, but rather beautiful Victorian brick buildings, landscaped grounds, and first-class facilities. It looks more like an Ivy League college than a reform school. It's all part of the school's method. Glen Mills looks at most juvenile delinquency not as a psychological problem, but as a sociological problem. With a wide variety of academic, vocational, and athletic programs, they seek to address the problem by giving the youthful offender a healthy pride and self-respect, and by creating a group norm that replaces negative peer group pressure with a peer group pressure that reinforces positive, responsible behavior. The school's director, Sam Farinola, says it begins the first week when the incoming student is given a more advanced student to act as his big brother. His big brother informs him that he is to behave just as the big brother behaves. And any time he does it, other students are going to confront him. And the big brother is going to be upset because it's a reflection on the big brother. So he gets up in the morning, the young man, and he must make his bed, he must take a shower. Then he attends, uh, gets up and goes to breakfast, comes back, makes sure his room is spotless, it's, it's inspected by upperclassmen, and then they have a group session. And he's given the first meeting to introduce him. 
to let him know what we do around here, what's expected of Glenn Mills, the pride that's in this school. He gets a feeling that the, his whole world is turned upside down because everything that gave him status on the street, he loses it here. The school's method has been a successful one. Since changing to its current system, their rearrest record has dropped 40 percent. In one recent six-year period, almost 1,000 kids at Glen Mills received their GED or Educational Development Certificate. That was more than all other juvenile corrections institutions in Pennsylvania combined. In that same period, the school sent 89 kids on to college. All this at about one half of the cost of most other similar institutions. Glen Mills was one of the first institutions of its kind in the country. Now, almost 170 years after its founding, it's first again, a leader in a new and promising rehabilitative process. In 1903, 11 years after the Glen Mills schools came to Thornberry, Cheney University was established on land which extends into the township. At the time, the university was known as the Institute for Colored Youth. The institute had been founded in 1837 and existed at three different locations in and around Philadelphia before it came here. The school's founder was the Quaker Richard Humphreys. Past president of Cheney, Dr. Laverne McCummings, spoke of Humphreys' vision during a Founders' Day speech. Philadelphia, Mr. Humphreys saw the struggle of freed blacks, particularly those who were skilled artisans. These artisans eventually had to compete with a great influx of immigrants. And as a result of their competition, blacks lost most or not all of the ground in their pursuit for excellence. Humphreys was disturbed by this. So he willed $10,000 to 13 fellow Quakers for the purpose of designing an institution to instruct the descendants of the African race in school learning in the various branches of the mechanic arts and trades and in agriculture in order to prepare and fit and qualify them to act as teachers. Over the years, Cheney has progressed from a school for orphans to state normal school status in 1921, state college status in 1959, and full university status in 1983. Currently, Cheney's campus serves some 1,200 students who study in a wide variety of graduate and undergraduate programs. The school is regarded as the oldest historically black institution of higher learning in the United States. It was the hope of its founder that the school produce African-American teachers. This hope has been dramatically realized as hundreds of Cheney students have gone on to teaching careers. In the late 1800s, the General Crushed Stone Company Quarry was established in the Glen Mills section of the township. The quarry product was a granite rock known as Baltimore Nice. It was used for railroad beds and general construction purposes. As technology advanced, the quarry's equipment became more and more sophisticated. This is the quarry's first electric shovel. Now 100 years after its founding, the quarry is still going strong. The quarry pit is now over 600 feet deep. Rock is blasted off the side walls, then taken to a crusher. by conveyors to various screens where it is sorted according to size. These various size stones have a number of uses, including use in driveways, drain fields, concrete mixes, and as erosion protection. Some of the stone is mixed into asphalt right at the quarry. The quarry's manager, Kim Snyder, gives us a perspective on just how much rock has been taken from the quarry. As you can see, this is a pretty large quarry. Uh, when this quarry was started, there was actually a, a hill or a mountain here which had uh, approximately the same elevation as, as the surrounding hills that you see. Uh, 
to the best of our knowledge, there's been some 80 million tons or more of stone that's been removed from this location uh, already. To give you a little perspective, uh, 80 million tons of stone is enough stone to build about 3,400 miles of two-lane highway. So for all intents and purposes, the stone that's been taken out of this quarry is enough stone to build almost every two-lane road in Delaware County. The General Crush Stone Company quarry has produced jobs and income for the township for 100 years. One Thornberry family, the McGurks, has had members working at the quarry for three generations. There are some 25 years of useful life left in the quarry, after which time it could possibly be allowed to fill with water and become a recreational lake or reservoir. On the western end of the township is beautiful Brenton Lake. In the early 1900s, farmland around the lake gradually became a summer resort colony. Summer cottages were built near the lake, and in 1918, the colony was formally organized as the Brenton Lake Club. The old Brenton Mill was remodeled and served as the clubhouse. As the club grew, recreational activities that became available included skating, trap shooting, horseback riding, as well as swimming, boating, and golf. The depression and stock market crash of 1929 hit the club hard. The golf course was sold. There were 1,000 members prior to 1929, but by 1932, there were only 210 paid up members. Today, the club has become the new Brenton Lake Club. Instead of the summer cottages of the 1920s, there are now year-round homes. Club members own their own land and communally maintain the lake, common land, and roads on the club's 125 acres. Since the heyday of the old Brenton Lake Club in 1925, Bob Balderston and his family have been raising and selling apples in Thornberry. His Fairhope Orchard has some 85 acres, 40 of which are in the township. In addition to apples, pumpkins, peaches, and pears are also raised. One of Fairhope's favorite products is apple cider, made right at the orchard. The apples are washed and ground into pulp before being put in a press to remove the juice. The cider and fruit are sold at Fairhope's retail outlet at the orchard. Some 6,000 gallons of cider are produced annually. In 1930, Broadmeadows, the Delaware County prison, was built on land which lies partially in Thornberry Township. The main prison buildings house some 900 male inmates. Female prisoners are kept in this building which also serves as the prison's administrative center. The prison's uniformed staff are available to assist in local emergencies like automobile accidents and missing persons searches. They also patrol the prison property in nearby areas. In earlier days, prisoners farmed the land around the prison. The meat and produce they raised completely supplied the prison's needs, and the sale of the surplus paid all prison salaries and expenses with money left over as a profit. In 1945, the Tangy homesteads were established in the township. Tangy is an intentional, cooperative community made up of 38 homes on 100 wooded acres. Tangy families each own or lease a two-acre lot. The families all co-own the pond, community center, common lands, and roads. The emphasis at Tangy is on cooperation, neighbor helping neighbor, being friends and getting involved in each other's lives. Tangy's recreational and social activities, once a month work days and group meetings are all aimed at encouraging participation in and contribution to community life. Tangy's residents are a racially, politically and religiously diverse group that is committed to making Tangy a community, not just a collection of homes. Over the course of Thornberry's history, 
A number of schools have helped to educate the children of the township. Thornton area kids were taught at the Western School. The Western School was founded in 1715 and existed in a number of buildings. This last home of the school was built in the late 1800s. The school has long since been closed and the building is now a private residence. The Central School was founded in this building in 1820. The building later became the African Methodist Episcopal Church. A stone school building was built in 1840 and replaced by this building in 1863. The school ceased operations in the early 1920s. The school building, outhouse still intact, is now a residence. The Eastern School was housed in several buildings before this building was built about 1901. Several additions have been made over the years to arrive at the current structure. Until it was closed in 1981, hundreds of Thornberry residents enjoyed the school's outdoor classroom and nature trail along the Chester Creek. Historian and collector Chris Sanderson was a teacher at the school in the 1920s and a popular figure in Thornberry. A Chad's Ford Museum now houses his collection of everything from pencil stubs to dirt from famous places. While at the school, he had a basketball team that played a game against the University of Pennsylvania, thus becoming probably the only elementary school team ever to play a college team. Penn beat the Thornberry team 45 to 17. There are many beautiful and historic places in Thornberry. As more and more people discover the area, the township is on the verge of some of the greatest growth and change in its 300 years of existence. The same local government and community cooperation that have helped to preserve its past will be needed to provide for the future of historic Thornberry Township. <laughs>